So uh, my description, um, I spent about half my time doing social media, and it was driving me nuts earlier when people were talking and it was all distorted. So if it gets distorted, someone wave at me, so I'll back off. Um, I spend about half my time doing social media, SEO, things like that. Um, and then I spend my other half of my time doing media stuff like photography and video. But I never really kind of promote myself as a photographer so much. Um, I just kind of get the jobs through word of mouth. So um, the bold stuff is what we're looking at. Giovanni is an online brand strategist. And I teach boot camps and workshops. And I do natural light, mainly photography. So we're going to talk today. Um, and one thing I do want to... I do want to pimp out is the latest project I'm working on is a show called Troubadour Texas, which is not just because I'm working on it, but it's super awesome. It's a one-hour weekly docu-reality show about musicians in the state of Texas, singer-songwriters. Um, we've already had two episodes. It's on CBS here in Houston on Sunday nights. Um, and uh, it's pretty neat because you'll see a lot of folks that you recognize, uh, the Chris Christophersons, the Willie Nelsons, the, the Hank, you know, no, well, he's dead. Um, <laughs> the Lyle Lovitz. And then you'll see a lot of folks from Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas that you haven't heard of that you, may, uh, you might uh, enjoy and become a fan of. So that's kind of neat. Um, I am with Troubadour, Texas. Um, I'm the, the still photography on the sh photographer on the social. When you look at the website, when you look at the TV show and there's still photography, that's all me. And then when they have somebody hanging off the bridge by their ankles with a video camera, I'm usually the one having their ankles held because nobody else will hang off the bridges. Um, so just like with social, usually when I, when I talk about SEO and social media, I start with the fact that I have no business teaching any about social media marketing because I'm actually a programmer. And I stumbled into t to marketing and, and SEO. I think most people stumbled into SEO by accident, uh, but certainly by into marketing and PR. Um, and I certainly stumbled into photography. I have no training in photography, and I do photography the same way I do marketing, which is kind of by the gut. Now, doesn't mean that I'm a complete moron. I'm out there just going, oh, I hope this works. But it means that it's street smarts. I, don't, I, I didn't go to school anywhere. I don't have a degree in any kind of art or media. So uh, I'm not really going to try to teach you anything, but I'm going to show you how I do what I do and what works for me and what doesn't. Uh, we're going to cover... Um, four major areas, kind of the equipment that I use. Then we'll talk about what happens before a shoot, what do we do during a shoot to get great pictures, and then what do you do after the shoot. And after the shoot, we will go directly into marketing about what do you, use, what do, you do with your, your photographs, because the point here is to teach folks how to take good pictures for marketing purposes, right? So part of this talk is about getting the right equipment, setting yourself up for success, good composition, the other part is, once I have my picture, then what do I do to that to enhance my marketing online? So it's two classes in one, the double mint twins. Okay, so with the equipment, we're going to talk about cameras right off the bat. Um, I need these back. And if y'all want to, or, um, I brought two of the main cameras that I use, and I'm going to explain what the good and the bad and how much they cost and what you can use also. Um, Canon 5D, which is their second to most expensive camera, is here. And i got to be honest with you, I've got major buyer's remorse with this camera. Um, it's a little bit older technology. You can hold on to it and pass it around and see how heavy it is. Um, takes amazingly gorgeous photos. It's about $2,500. Um, beautiful photos, but it's a little bit older technology. And I've had to relegate myself using this camera to using it on a tripod, using it in a studio, using it in a very controlled environment. And if you look at these images, this was actually a shot I did yesterday. This is for a CD that, that this gentleman, Ron Bailey, is about to put out. This is going to be the CD cover. And these are folks that played on the album with him. And these are them just sitting in a coffee shop. The, the photography is absolutely beautiful as long as you're in a controlled environment. Now this, for the most part, is natural light. And we're going to talk about composition here a little bit later on. The only thing that I'm using, I hardly ever, with the exceptions I'm going to show you, use flash. I hate flash because I don't know how to use it well enough, and I'm, it's pretty uncontrollable for me. So what I do is I use these really small lights that I just point at people, these micro lights. Um, and, and the website is called a Light Panel or Micro Light. You can do a search and you can find them. You can get a really small one for about $69. And in this situation, you see how well, there were no lights here in the cafe, and you see how well lit Ron's face is. I've got a light sitting right on the piano just pointing right at him. And it's meant for video, but I use it for photography because it allows me to point the camera at the subject, 
the camera meters on what his face is and then takes a picture and exposes it properly. It's, to it's a total hack. And I'll tell you that a lot of stuff I'm going to show you today are things that, that uh, professional photographers, I think, would absolutely die that I do. And that's why I started off with I'm a hack. The, set, the Canon 7D, which costs less than, or about half of what that 5D does, this is my workhorse. And it looks and feels almost exactly like the 5D does. It's about $1,500. Um, main differences here is that this takes a smaller picture than that one does, but the sensors in here and the technology inside of it is, is newer technology. Uh, the camera is a lot more forgiving, and it also shoots about eight frames a second, which is really important if you're doing sports or you're doing like concert photography. Uh, the 5D that's being passed around only shoots about three or four per second. And so again, it's a situation where um, if you're doing stuff that's, that's live action, there's a lot of stuff going on, you definitely want to have something like a 7D. Um, I'll, the, the highest end camera they have, the 1D, is something that I'll probably never, uh, I could never stomach going and, and putting in about eight, nine thousand dollars up for that. These are shots that are taken with the 7D. Um, this is just in a nightclub. This is obviously behind the band. I'm standing behind the drummer and shooting that. And again, the, the thing that, that, that really surprised me about the ability of that camera to take shots like this is this is pretty obvious. This is, this is Robin Creaseman standing on stage speaking to an audience, and he's really well lit. There was next to no lights over here because we're looking behind the band looking into the audience. So the lights are typically coming this way. And if you sit there and you, and, and you use the 7D to focus on the subject, man, it lights them up beautifully using the ambient light in the room. And use the technology well enough, you, you start to learn where, where it will uh, uh, cut you a break and, and do favors for you. Um, the Canon T21 is an old version. They have a Canon T3 now. The T21, to simplify, and this is unbelievably simplified, the T21 is basically a 7D in a different body. It's got a little bit different sensor in it. But when you're shooting video, off of one of these guys. These guys are about $1,600. This guy can be gotten for about 800 bucks. When you're shooting video with the T2i, it's the exact same file. It's the exact same video coming out of the camera. Um, there are other, obviously other differences. Uh, the, T, the, the 7D will take a lot more punishment in the field. It's water resistant. There's a lot of other stuff. And, there's, and the sensor in there is different, but uh, to the lay person, um, not enough, you know, if you're an amateur, if you're beginning, it's not enough for you to be terribly worried about. And then the Canon G12 is my point and shoot. Um, I always have that with, I'm going to say I always have that with me. I don't have it with me now. Um, Canon G12 is a camera that you use when you're not allowed to use, do photography in an event. So you're getting in somewhere. You want to take photography, but they, they're not allowing it. You didn't get a photo pass. Um, there's next to no event around today that you can't pull out a, a point and shoot camera and use that at, that at the event without, you know, without having security stop you. Um, Canon G12 has a lot of the same functionality as these larger DSLR cameras. It's got a fix, it's got a lens that's built into it, so that's, that, that uh, is limiting, but you have control over timed releases, you have control over aperture, stuff like that. And so if you learn the controls on the camera, you can get very specific with, with uh, the kind of photography. This is shot with a G12. Now, obviously I'm standing off stage, I'm looking directly down uh, the, the guitarist and looking down her guitar. Um, I'm probably standing about eight feet away from her, so I'm zoomed in all the way. But it's amazing to me, and, and when you look at a lot of photography out there these days, it can be pretty mind-blowing at the quality of pictures that can come out of some of these cameras. That G12 is like $300. Um, you set yourself up, you get the right light, you learn the controls on the camera. Uh, the stuff that comes out of here can be really, really beautiful. So those are the basic cameras I use. I use uh, you know, iPhone for Instagram. Um, and then for video stuff, I use GoPros a lot. I use the Canon Vexia video cameras. I really love shooting video with the DSLRs, but be cautioned if you're at a company and you want to go out. You've heard a lot of great um, information about how you can shoot video with a, with a 7D, with a 5D. The video looks amazing. They overheat really, really quickly, especially in the tech. If you're shooting outside, when, it w when we were running through these 105, 106 degree days, these cameras were literally overheat and shut off in seven to eight minutes. So in those situations, when you're, when you're using these cameras, I've got these other regular Canon video cameras at the ready. I've also got a couple of, I, I usually carry two Kevin, uh, 7Ds with me, a couple of T2Is. You always have something to, ba to, to back you up as well. Um, 
when I got here today, <laughs> this, is, th this was interesting, Kurt was in here talking about camp for all. And I'm sitting over listening to this guy who's, who's, who, who runs a camp here for, for people with special needs, whether they're you know, learning disabled, whether they're blind, whether they're burned victims. I mean, there's all kinds of folks they cater to. And when you talk about somebody that's got a job like that, and he was explaining about how you know, part of his job, there's some people that have, uh, suffer from like incontinence, and so he's got to go and help adults go to the restroom sometimes. And when he explains to people what his job is at this camp, most people's response is, oh my gosh, you're more man than I am. I mean, you, you've got an amazing heart. It's unbelievable. And his response is, is, I have never, ever had a job that I wasn't absolutely passionate about, that I didn't love, because he gets so much out of that job, right? Well, one thing that, that I've learned really quickly about the technology we have with photography today is the filters that you have on cameras. You go look at Instagram, and you have these people taking you know, pictures with, with, with iPhones, and the photography looks amazing because you've got 12 fantastic filters to choose from. You take a picture of your friend standing on the dike, and then you go and put a filter on there, and there's beautiful sunset. You've got a lake behind them. They're standing on the dike, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, you have to make sure that you don't confuse the, and I don't want to say gimmicky nature of that stuff, but whenever you're thinking about using rich media for your marketing and for a tool to, to create a, a message for your brand, that the people doing this have an absolute passion for what they do. Um, you can get somebody that knows some of the basics of photography, but you've got to get somebody that absolutely bleeds and loves photography and wants to be able to tell a story through photography. And it doesn't matter if they've got a Canon 5D or they've got an iPhone. The point is, is that they will do what they have to do to convey a story behind your brand, behind your marketing messages. Um, whenever, I run pro whenever I go and run uh, uh, programming teams as like a project manager, I always focused on getting a hold of programmers that had a good work ethic, that were t B team players. I hated hiring A team players that were full of themselves, that were not humble, because they would come in and they would walk, strut around the place because they were the best you know, person on the team and they knew it and it would create a cancer on the team for us because then all of a sudden you create all this resentment. Same thing with photography. When you're picking someone else on your team, I would suggest you pick someone who is dying to be a photographer who may not have the skills yet because they will do what has to be done to learn how to do it correctly and they'll go the extra mile for you. Building relationships, and th this is actually another shot um, of a band from, from, from Tyler called Isley. I, 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 I discovered them. I, I saw them for the first time last year at South by Southwest and absolutely fell in love with them. They're a family from, from, from uh, Tyler, three sisters. Their brother plays drums and, and their cousin play, plays bass for them. And first time I saw them at South by Southwest, I did some search, did search on the internet, found out their dad is the manager for the, for, for the band, saw his picture. First thing I did, I didn't even bother with the band. I went and found their dad and introduced myself to him and said, hey, photographer up in Dallas, the next time you're there, please, I'd love it if I could you know, shoot, shoot the band when they're up there. Um, they come up to Dallas. I go and I shoot the band. I do the best job I possibly can because at this point, this, I've become a fan of these guys and I want to get access to them. Um, I shoot the band. I do the best job I can. I do the best job I can in editing. and I send them over to, to, to their dad and I say, you guys use this forever you want to, whatever you want to use it for. He's like, can we use it in, in the next CD? Absolutely, you, whatever you want to do. So that allows me to, first and foremost, have the servant of a heart. I've gone and I've seen something that I want, but I have to go and prove myself first by providing value to them if I'm going to turn around and get something back in return. So you have the heart of a servant. You go and you deliver value to get access, to build a relationship. This picture was taken about two weeks ago. They did a tour of the Southeast. They came back and they played a, 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 a show at uh, um, the blah, 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 the blah, blah, blah theater in Tyler. I can't think of it. Liberty Theater in, in uh, Tyler. Um, and one thing that I love and that I, I love shooting music because it's fun. I hate shooting music because you're usually stuck in front of the stage looking up people's nostrils trying to find a good angle. And when you're there and there's eight other photographers there, you're shooting the exact same stuff they are. I really, really work hard and strive to find different angles and get different shots of stuff. And so for me, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, I don't want to give away the, the I don't want to give everything away right now. But for me, I got there at the, at, at the Liberty and I took all the shots I was going to take 
And then I start thinking, how do I get the shot that no one else is going to get? Go back over to the dad. Hey, how you doing? Remember, I'm Gio. I gave you the picture from Dallas. Hey, yeah, how you doing? Can I ask you a favor? If I'm like really careful, can I go back in the side, to, to the side wings of, uh, of the stage and shoot from, from back to the stage? Yeah, that's fine. He walks me over there. He lets me back in there. And, I, and, and, and as I'm walking, I turn around. I said, can you do me another favor? He says, what? Well, can you not let anybody else back here? Because I want the shot. And I didn't tell him that, but he knew what I meant. And he said, absolutely no problem. So I get back there, and this is them playing on stage in the middle of a song, and I'm literally like from here, the curtain's here for the stage, and, and, and Chantel's sitting here, and I'm sitting there shooting her directly from the stage, and I get this amazing shot of her. This is a, with a prime lens, so I didn't have a zoom. I'm literally saying this, this far away, and this is the kind of shot that I know that when I got it, I'm like, that is the money shot. That's what I'm looking for. You guys have to find ways, and don't get me wrong, you can take good pictures, but the point here is to find ways for you guys to take amazing pictures that will help get more views on them, create a fan base, create engagement, because the fans of Isley, they can find 10,000 pictures of this band from the front row shot up like this. I've gotten so many amazing comments about the photography from behind the stage because it's photography that those fans can't get anywhere else which builds my credibility as a photographer. Also, it's helping my SEO because I'll talk to you later about how I optimize the pictures. But this is a, a direct result of, in a very quick turnaround, I mean, I met the dad in South By, shot them a few months later at Dallas, gave them the pictures. A few months later, they go to Tyler, boom, he gives me access backstage. I mean, that was really, sometimes it's like, it takes years to develop relationships like that. Um, before you go out, and this is kind of a, 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 a uh, chicken before the egg deal. Um, if you want to go out and you want to do this stuff on a professional or semi-professional basis, you have to build a portfolio. Because it's like, hey, I want to go shoot shots of great music. I want to go shoot shots at fashion shows. I want to get invited to events and stuff. Well, how do you do that? You show people all the pictures of the shows you shot and the events you shot and the fashion shows. Well, I don't have those. How do I get those? You go and you do it for free. Now, there's two ways to do it. And, I'm, and it's really critical. I've got that second line there. But Number one is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give away something here really quick. Number one is you just simply ask, and you, and you ask it as a journalist. If you can, get yourself hooked up with a website that needs content that's got decent amounts of traffic. Um, I shoot a lot of stuff for a, a site up in Dallas called Jam Magazine Online. Um, obviously, directly related to music, to uplusdallas.com, arts and entertainment and stuff. And so I can point people to my work on those sites, which I've done for free. They're basically blogs. But these sites have, you know, hundreds of thousands of hits on a per month. Not millions, but hundreds of thousands. And I can point to these sites and say, hey, here's examples of my work. Can I get access to your event? And the sites can look good enough, and I'll show you a screenshots of them here in a second, that right off the bat, the band or the event or the fashion show or whatever it is says, that's a nice looking brand. I'm fine with being associated with that. When you go and ask for access to something, one of the most important things people are looking for is, what is it going to do for me? So don't go and ask them if you can shoot for your blog. They don't care about your blog. They want to know what website, what publication, what you're shooting for, and they want to know the size of the audience. Now, one trick that you can use when you're coming up with an audience number, look at the traffic on the website, and if whatever brand you're shooting for, if they have a Facebook fan page, Add the Facebook fans into that. Add the Twitter followers to it. If you have YouTube, add that. Get, get an accumulation of all of the engagement you have with that brand. And don't call them and say, look, we get 9,000 hits a week. Say, we've got an audience of 9,000 plus everything else. You do everything you can to let the, pe the people know that you're asking for access for, to this place for what the totality of the audience is. And if you really want to get crazy, you can say, look, I've got, you know, 8,000 Twitter followers on my brand. On average, each Twitter follower has about 400 followers themselves. About 10% of those people will see this, which means we're going to extrapolate that out, and we actually have an audience of about 42,000, whatever. But you want that number to be as big as possible. That's the only thing, that is the only thing that people are interested in whenever they're making a decision to give you access to something or not. Um, the other thing is, I think I wrote this fairly big, you're going to go and do stuff for people and establish relationships with them, like with Isley. I've gone and I've done some stuff for them because I wanted to get access to. 
the first time that Bud, their dad, the first time he calls me and asks me to be somewhere, I'm establishing a value for my product. I will never, ever, ever let anybody ask me to shoot something for free. I'm the one who asks for free. And just like we, uh, in, in the previous session over here in the other room, uh, dead, dead on with, with, with four kitchens, Ted, Ted Newcourt mentioned, the second that you establish the value of your product as zero, you can never go above that. You're pushing the bounds here. But what you're trying to do with photography, if you're trying to get yourself out there, is to show people what your work looks like. The second they show you that they're interested in buying it, you have to charge them something. Because if you don't, you will never be able to charge them anything. Okay, going um, some planning stuff. And this is some, of, and these are like school of hard knocks. These are the things I've learned as doing this stuff. And it's, it's interesting with the planning stuff is that I would never dream of like starting a programming project, you know, a website de design or development project without planning ahead. You would never dream of like starting a social media campaign without planning. But there's so many people that do photography that are just like, hey, I got access to so-and-so, I'll see you there. And they've never been to the venue, they just like show up whenever everybody else gets there and they walk in and they're just like, it's dark and they just have to wait for the band to come on. You've got to plan ahead to know where the entrances are, where the exits are, where's the green room, where are the bathrooms, all kinds of stuff. Um, make sure that before you get there, if you're shooting with multiple people, if, if you're going in there, you're the photographer and you've got a rider with you who might be writing something, you need to make sure that you've got contact with them. This is totally nerdy and you look like a, a complete dweeb when you're doing it, but phones and texts typically don't work in places like that because you're busy shooting whatever. So we, we, we've gone out and bought like these really cheap Radio Shack radio, kind of ham radio things that have the earpieces in them so that you can just sit there and talk to each other while you're working. Because if you, tr if you rely on phone, it, it never fails that I'm sitting there working. I'm like, I got to check and I look down here. Oh, so so tried to contact me 45 minutes, late, 45 minutes ago. Too late. Missed an opportunity. Um, make sure that you plan the kind of shots that you want to get. When you're shooting anything, really, music, and I'm using music as an example mainly because of the title and because it's, it's really good to kind of split stuff up between like a singer and like the rest of the band. Whenever you're shooting anything, let's say you're at an event and you, you're, as part of a marketing campaign, your company's been hired to go produce an event. Um, it's a wedding or it's a reception or something like that. It's painfully obvious that you want to get shots of the host. It's painfully obvious that you want to get shots of three or four people that you know through the process of being hired for the event. You've got to make sure that you have a list of the other things you've got to make sure you, get, you capture. Are there catering elements at, this, at, the, at the event? Do you have two or three people? And this is one of the things that I'm terrible about is knowing when there are famous people in the room. Because I am, for being somebody who works in media and PR and online, I don't have a TV at my house. And I swear to God, I, I could be standing next to David Bowie and I have no idea that it was David Bowie. And, and as an example, literally, last week, we're shooting one of the episodes for Troubadour, Texas, and my wife and my two girls are there. And um, I'm going to bring religion on you. Um, so I'm sitting there with my wife and my two daughters there, and I'm running around shooting, and they're kind of shooting the episode and stuff, and my wife kind of, you know, as I'm walking by one time, she kind of leans over and she says, number one, you're sweating, go wipe your, head, your, wipe, wipe your forehead off. Number two, is that Carrie Job sitting right there? And if you know Christian music, Carrie Job is like a mega Christian music star. And my daughters go to a Christian school, and it just so happens that one of the parents at my daughter's school wrote a song called a Revelation Song, who won, which won a Dove Award, which is like the Christian music version of like an Emmy or a Grammy. And so I recognize the name totally, right? And I look over and I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know if that's her or not. And so I turn around and ask the producer. The producer says yes. And so I'm sitting there like walking around this, you know, this woman you know, and she probably was fine with it because she probably gets inundated any time she goes anywhere. But she's like this major star in, in Christian music, and I have like no clue. So in that situation, thank goodness my wife was there to go, oh, you might want to shoot some shots of her sitting here watching your TV show. Um, even if you do recognize people that are important, local socialites, things like that, if you're there with a group, you've got to make sure that people communicate to you when somebody of importance whether they are related to your client, whether they're a celebrity, whatever, has come into the room so you can make sure you get that shot. Absolutely critical. Um, we'll talk about alternate interests later. 
asking for, for access but being pre prepared for beg to beg for forgiveness. And this bleeds into a couple of other things. As you start doing this stuff and as you start posting your pictures online and developing relationships, some of the relationships you're going to have with, P with PR companies, marketing companies, venues, and you'll start just getting notices ahead of time when they're having events. And which is really, really nice because then you, I mean, it took me about eight months to a year to start just being notified when things were happening, which is totally, and you never get to everything, but it's super nice to not have to be like hound dog and everything all the time, right? Um, but there are situations where um, you have to beg forgiveness, which means that you ask for access, access is denied for some reason, and if it's like a, a concert, you go and you buy your ticket and you find a way to get your DSLR. Obviously, I can't bring in my whole backpack then, but I will at least go to the door and see if I can get in with the DSLR so I can get good shots. If they're frisking you and checking you to make sure you're not bringing anything that they don't want you in there, you may not make it in. Um, if they're not, then you take your, your G12. Absolutely understanding that you didn't get permission to shoot the stuff, and so there is a very good possibility that you might be grabbed by the back of the sh shirt and let out. Um, I'll talk about another situation that once I did get access, then I kind of pushed the bounds a little bit. But if you want to get the good shots, if you, if you want to really push the bounds of becoming a really, really good photographer, that's kind of a measure for me of the passion. If someone is focused on shooting something, an event, a show, concert, whatever, you find a way to get in and you find a way to get the shots. Small footprint, um, any chance you get, no matter if you've got access or not. Um, I tend to be a pack rat, and I carry this huge thing around with me. And this is as small as I've been able to get. And I usually carry two cameras in there, and usually it's, it's not the 5D, it's a 7D, and then a backup 7D, and a few different lenses. But um, especially if you're working in places that have a really huge area to work in, let's say you're at the Houston Rodeo, or you're working you know, a football game over at, is it Reliance Stadium here? I was about to say the Astrodome. Um, so you're working something like that at Reliance Stadium, or you're working at some kind of a huge conference, like you go to Vegas and they have these gargantuan conferences and stuff. And this doesn't mean that you have to be there as a photographer. If, if your company hires you to go and write about an event, they want you to live blog it, then you want great photography, but you can't be walking around with a huge backpack like that. I actually popped, um, um, uh, I, I popped one of the, uh, what am I thinking about, spiny things. Any doctors in the house? I blew a disc in my back, and so like I'm taking Meloxicam every day to kind of manage the pain, but I haven't learned my lesson. I'm still carrying that thing around. Um, oh, something else for show and tell. So these are um, the keys to the kingdom. And this is really what, what I want you to look at. This little thing that you hang around your neck that just says media in big letters on it, this will allow 99% of the people that you walk by just to kind of move out of the way and let you walk. We made these at Kinko's. And I swear to God, it's the key to the city. Um, you know, and, and, and the other media badges, I mean, I've got, a, and I've got a ton of them because I put my other, a lot of times people don't give you badges, they give you stickers, so we just kind of put stickers on there and cover them up. But um, there's one there for Troubadour, Texas, and this generic one is for, for U Plus Media. Um, it's, it's unreal. The combination of that, and, and, and these things are like unbelievably heavy, but walking in, the bigger the camera you have, the more access you get. And it's, it's like... It's in one of my tips, we'll talk about that later. The media badge is probably like the cheapest, most valuable thing you can do if you want to get access to places and do, and do photography or videography. Um, these are a couple of websites I mentioned earlier. Um, also, it's really important that whenever you're calling and asking someone for access to something, don't describe yourself as a blogger. I think bloggers are cool. We think bloggers are cool. Most of the word, world thinks that we're a bunch of nuts that sit at home in our underwear and complain about Obama or W, whichever one you don't like. Um, if you're doing photography, and I learned this a long time ago, and it was kind of an accident, I'm a photojournalist. I don't, I don't take pictures from my blog. I'm a photojournalist. If you're writing for a blog, you don't ask for access to ACL or South by Southwest by saying, I want to write for my blog. You're a writer. 
You're a journalist and you want access. And it's amazing how little things like that will be enough to turn the tides and get you access to somewhere as opposed to, mm, we don't, and, and you will get responses back that say, we don't get access to bloggers. And you're like, it's kind of like when you leave money on your table, you're like, no. You know, I should have used the other word. Um, that's covered up. This is fairly important too when you're out, and this happened to us yesterday when we were shooting this CD, because we were doing a, a combination of shooting the, the, the CD case and it was going to be an episode for Troubadour, Texas. So we shoot the CD in, in the coffee house. We go outside and the host is interviewing me about the whole process of photography for the show. And we're on a public street. Guy walk, anytime someone walks up to you with a clipboard, be concerned. Um, so we're, and it's a public street, it's downtown Dallas. Guy walks up with a clipboard and starts asking us, what are you shooting? What is it for? And these guys, I mean, you know their security for the building, right? But they're plain clothes um, and they're taking notes. Really super important that when you're out shooting stuff that anyone, no one but a police officer can make you stop shooting anything. Whether you're a blogger or a citizen or a professional journalist, no one has the right to tell you not to shoot. The first thing they will say when they don't want you to shoot, you can be walking in the middle of the street in Houston, turn around and start shooting the building of uh, 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 the, the offices of a building or something, security will come out and say, well, for protective services, or they'll say, since 911, and your response is to look down and say, am I on a public street? They'll say yes or no. If they say no, then you ask, where does your property end? Where's the property line? Three steps back, lift up your camera and start shooting again. There's nothing they can do about it. It's the public space. If they, the next thing they will do is threaten to call the police. You tell them, please do. The police will come and the police will go, are you in a public space? Yes. Nothing you can do. Well, we don't like them shooting. I don't care. Nothing you can do. But it's one of the biggest things that you will get hassled with as a photographer, if you're out kind of shooting lifestyle stuff, you're shooting urban landscapes, things like that. Now, there are plenty of situations where you will be shooting something, not plenty. There's some situation where, where you may be shooting and you're shooting something sensitive. Maybe I'm shooting um, a, a National Guard armory because I like the tanks in there. Well, certainly they could come out and say stop it because there is an issue with, with uh, with, uh, you know, since 911, that we, those are sensitive areas, we don't want you shooting that stuff. And, you know, use, use your brain. Don't be unnecessarily confrontational when that stuff pops up. But if you do get into a situ situation A, whenever you have private security coming at you and you start to feel a little bit threatened, or when you have the police there, the second that something starts to happen, as you're talking to somebody, you open up your camera, I don't care if they see you do it or not, you open up your camera, and you pop out the card, you slip it in your pocket, you've always got a crappy blank card in your pocket with you. And I'll tell you what, nine times out of ten, the person you're talking to won't realize what you're doing. You pop in the other card, it's blank. And so as you're talking, if you feel like you're being threatened and you've got to give them something to get away, you never hand them your equipment. The police, if they ask for it, give it to them. You don't, they shouldn't have any reason to, they certainly may say, I want those discs. Okay, cool, I'll give you the disc out of my camera. You hand it to them, and you've got your pi pictures in your pocket, and you walk away. If the police, and you, you've got to be clever about this, if they say, give me the disc in your camera, that's what you do. If they say, give me the pictures you took, you don't want to screw the police over, and so typically what you're doing is you've got a backup with you, so you're shooting, maybe you're outside and you're shooting for half an hour, an hour or so. This guy will recognize that I pop a disc in there and it'll copy them onto the hard drive in here. So even if I do have to give it up, I'll pop that in there and throw that back in my bag and I'll take a clean disc and put it in here. So I've always got maybe an hour's worth of, of, of pictures on a drive, but that's it. I don't lose everything I've been doing that day. So. Th this obviously gets into a, to an area where you're like, holy cow, what kind of situation am I going to be in? As you start doing this more and more often, you definitely will find yourselves, in, in, and if you're not prepared and don't think about this stuff, and this is a hard drive um, backup, uh, it's actually a, a hyperdrive, it's for iPads, but it works awesome for CF cards and SD cards. It's like 199 bucks. If you're doing it and people are paying you to do this stuff, 
you've got to make sure that you're kind of thinking about, well, I back up my data at home. I've got to make sure that I'm, when I'm out here shooting that I'm keeping copies or that I'm only shooting like for 30 minutes on a card and I'm putting it in my bag and I'm putting a new card out. So if something like this pops up, then I don't lose everything that I've been doing that day. Be patient, be nice, be respectful, and make sure that you try to be invisible whenever you're shooting. Um, whenever you, part of your planning process, and you should have done this ahead of time, but you've got to make sure that you're disciplined when you get somewhere, is that you should have a shot list of the things that you need to get. And if you're shooting just because you want to shoot, I mean, get yourself disciplined so that you're thinking about this stuff so you can be more purposeful about what you do when you go out and you don't show up and you're just like click, 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 whatever. Have a purpose when you get there. You will find that you're much more, um, you become much more appreciative of the work you did because you had a plan ahead of time. If you're doing it for somebody and they're paying you, good God, please have a shot list. Never show up somewhere and just go, oh, I'll just kind of take shots. So when you get somewhere, Get the shots you're supposed to get ahead of time. Get that just out of the way. And they don't have to be amazing shots, but make sure you cover the basics. This sounds a lot like my kind of gray hat, black hat talk. Once you get those, then you start becoming creative and looking for different angles that nobody else would get. And again, we go back to the point that because of technology, I mean, these 7D, like this camera and like the T2i, these things are so unbelievably forgiving. Anybody can take amazing pictures with these things. So you've really now got to push yourself to find ways to get shots that other people aren't going to show up with afterwards. Look for different angles, things like that. A um, couple of things on this one. <laughs> um, uh, Robin, obviously speaking in San Antonio. Um, a, the fisheye. The fisheye is such a cheesy thing to use in photography. Professional photographers are like, oh my God, you know. But two things. Number one, time and time again, it's the crowd favorite. People love pictures taken with a fisheye lens. Um, so anytime I want to go and I really want to exaggerate something, do with the fisheye lens. The reason why I purposefully was kind of laying myself out right in front of the stage when Robin was speaking is that, believe it or not, Robin is shorter than I am. And so when I'm out here shooting, I'm doing everything I can to make him look tall. Because the photography here is, he, he, he's a member of the, the International Speakers Association, and the photography we're taking is to become part of his new portfolio. So he's got to look in command and big, and anytime I'm out know, shooting in the audience, if I get him at the wrong angle, even though he's on stage, you can tell that stature-wise, he's kind of a short guy. Um, so make sure that you, obviously I'm in front of the stage, so I'm not invisible, but you're going to break some rules. Make sure that you're doing things, and, and if you're sitting here shooting, and you kind of look around, and you're feeling kind of awkward, you just kind of have to get over that. I mean, you just, you just really have no option. Yeah. I'll be done by like seven. Is that fine? Okay. Um, be present, be alert. This is one of the, my very, very favorite pictures that I've ever taken. This is at Kerrville Folk Festival. And I know now that this woman's name is Heather Reese. I didn't know who she was when I took her shot, when I took her picture. What? Is that amazing? That, that's, one of those, that's one of those pictures that after you take it, you're like, who did I give my camera to? That's awesome. Um, I mean, this is like when the stars really align, right? So I'm actually, when I saw her, I'm standing over here on the other side of the crowd, and she's over here absolutely by herself just kicking up dust and just dancing to the music all by herself in this big area here. So I kind of make my way around. And I'm already at the mindset that I'm going to beg forgiveness. I'm just going to start shooting pictures. And if she stops and gets freaked out, I'm going to have to apologize. But I cannot stop her from being in the zone. I got about 20 pictures off. And what happened here is obviously sun's going down. Dust is all up in the air. And look at the rays coming through that. If I had not been standing, because I was in a situation where I'm actually working. We're, we're covering Kerrville Foot Music Festival in Shubert, Texas. And so I was like having to do other stuff for the TV show. But any time I get a break, I stop and I'm like scanning and looking for something because I'm like, okay, I've got 15 minutes. What can I do? And the only thing that caught my eye here was that she was out there by herself. I had no idea that this was happening until I got on the other side of her. And obviously, I'm really close to her. She saw me, kept on dancing. I found out later she was unbelievably drunk, so that's why she didn't care. <laughs> um, 
But even in a situation like that, you know, uh, you know, after I you take her shot, I saw her a couple of times after that during the night, and I finally just handed her my, handed her my card and said, you know, I'm the guy that was taking your pictures over there. I'm not a weirdo. If you want the picture, shoot me an email. Turns out I have like four friends in Dallas that went to school with her at Texas A&M, and all of them were like, oh, yeah, she parties. <laughs> um, shoot everything and shoot until you get, get kicked out or until there's nothing else to shoot. Um, let me see if I've got this pulled up over here. I'm going to pull my phone out so I actually do see the time because I don't want to keep you all here past eight. Eight minutes, we're screwed. That's not a, I'm just going to tell the story. I'm not going to pull it up. Um, so one of the very first things I shot was Kiss up in, in Pizza Hut Park up in Frisco, which is a suburb of Dallas. And it was like one of the first things I got hired to do when I was like going nuts. I'm like, oh my God, it's Kiss, right? Um, so we get up there and when we go to get the photo passes, we find out that our photo passes allow us access to everything but Kiss. And it was like, it was like an all day music festival. I'm like, Pat Green, really? I want shots of Pat Green? Not really. You know, um, so we're doing the shots, and I get every, I get everything that I can, and they're doing some interviews and stuff like that. Um, and then when it comes time for Kiss to come on, their PR company uh, people come down to the to the photographer's pit, and they just basically push everybody everybody's out. Now, if you've been given access, come back over here. Only people that got access were the Dallas Observer and the Dallas Morning News. Nobody else gets access. So I'm like, what do I do now? I've got to get pictures of Kiss. Well. Before then, when I was walking around, I was busy building relationships. <laughs> so we're doing our shots and stuff, and I'm making friends with the roadies and stuff. And I go and I establish myself as being somebody that's supposed to be back there behind stage, right? Talking to the roadies and whatnot. About 30 minutes before Kiss came on, I go back to one of the guys and I go, man, I lost my lanyard. And I'm not quite sure, am I, I going to be able to stay back here? Because if I, I mean, I don't want to get myself in trouble. The guy knew me from talking to me all day long. He's like, man, don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. He goes back to the back. He comes back with a lanyard that has Kiss on it, working crew, which gave me access to everything. So then, and I don't have the shots up there on my Flickr account, but I'm literally, again, standing on the side. The photographers are down here in the pit, getting the crotch shot, shooting up their nose, all that kind of stuff. I'm standing on the side of the stage, and Paul Stanley is about 15 feet in front of me, and I'm just shooting him straight on. That lasted about three songs before security goes... Only two people have access to the, to the thing. So a guy comes up, pulls me off, says you need to go back into the audience. Now, I know you don't have access because you're not with these guys. Go down into the audience, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll shoot what I can here. I start shooting what I can in there. The guys were watching me, and I also am in the crowd like a complete freaking moron. I'm in the crowd shooting this thing up in the air. <laughs> Hi, can't see me here. So they catch me again, and they're like, no, you've got, you've got to put your camera away put the cameras away, I go to the other side of the stage and I'm like, but I've still got the working badge, maybe I can get back over there. So I go back over to the security guy behind stage, I show him my badge, and in these situations they're just like glance at it, wave you on. So he waves me on, I go backstage, I get on the other side of the stage and get through about half of a song and a guy comes up that was probably eight times larger than me and looks at me and he goes, you know we got radios. I'm like, oh, and he like escorted me out to the parking lot. <laughs> um, but I still have my KISS badge, so which is pretty awesome. Um, but but the, thing, the thing with that situation is I've never had anybody take my card. I've heard of people have their cards taken from them. But in those situations, they're like, you're breaking the rules, get out. And that's like the worst thing they can do for you. I'm like, cool, I got 150 pictures of KISS. I don't care. Um, and that kind of stuff scares the bejesus out of my wife. And I'm like, honey, I mean, it's not like we're in Syria. I mean, it's... A kiss concert they're going to kick me out and I won't be able to go back in it's not a big deal um, same thing I just said earlier let me a couple of things I want to cover here and the, these 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 slides are going to be available to you guys and I'm going to go to something that is a big hit on the social sites so we've taken our stuff we've taken our pictures and I talk a little bit about kind of like um, using filters and composition rule of thirds. You can go to Google and type in top 10 photography tips and you're going to find this stuff up. Absolutely critical though, whenever you're using a marketing campaign, once you get your pictures back home, what do you do with them now? What do you do with them to, to besides the fact of, uh, besides the visual aspect of I've got something that tells a story, what do I do now with the help with social and with SEO and stuff like that? 
uh, most critical thing you can do, and, and it amazes me that people that do so SEO still don't do this stuff, um, is to optimize the files. Now, we know, if we're SEO people, that Google doesn't know what's inside your picture, right? But there's an unbelievable amount of data that you can shove into this file that all the search engines read, and that helps you categorize this content, and it includes hyperlinks. And so, if you're, whether you're using iPhoto on a Mac, and even with iPhoto, you see that up here I've got photography by at Giovanni, Kylie Ray Harris with a hyperlink here and a description down here. iPhoto, which is free and comes with every Mac, allows you to edit metadata. And if you really want to go nuts, Aperture unleashes all kinds of stuff that you can edit. This is, these, this is all text content that is stored inside of a, a photo file. You do the same thing with video. I mean, we could talk for three hours about optimizing video content that has nothing to do with titles and tags. It's all the information that's stored inside of a file. And look at the amount of data there. I mean, it's, that's like more data than you would put like on a web page. Um, hyperlinks, whenever this goes up to, to Flickr, and, I, and, and some of y'all, if you have seen me speak, have seen me show this stuff on Flickr. I haven't shown that kind of detail, though. But these things get converted into live links. And I did, when I uploaded this to Flickr, I edited nothing. I took that file, uploaded it. Flickr read that metadata and just populated it for me automatically. Google Photos, that's what you see down here. You don't see all the crap whenever it shows up on the web. This is just a picture off of Google. But all that data is stored inside that image there. Now, the rules apply doing that stuff the same way they would for a web page. You don't spam, you don't stuff keywords, you make sure that what you describe inside the picture is actually what's in the picture, and you be respectful of the fact that you're trying to do something to help you get ranked, but you don't go too far. Um, once you get that metadata in there, you share it everywhere you can. SlideShare drives tons of traffic. If you've got a really nice portfolio, you've got 15, 20 pictures of a conference you went to, Here's a trick. You go and create a, a PowerPoint deck of your images. You make sure that all the people that you have pictures of, their names are in that. Because what do we do as a bunch? I mean, we're a bunch of navel-gazing nerds. We go home and search for ourselves. So this stuff pops up. SlideShare is one of the most popular websites out there. And all the links inside this content, inside your SlideShare presentation, are feeding the, the, uh, the Google, the Google algorithm. Um, Instagram, I haven't done a whole lot of tests with that, but, it, but you can still put the metadata in there. Um, don't you dare interrupt me again. What is this, your conference? You think this is your event? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because Google can read the text inside of the, the PowerPoint, right? You take that image and you drop it in there, and PowerPoint can read the, the XSIF data inside there. All that text is still shoved in that file. It looks hideous, but it's still readable by the search engines. Get on it, girl. Are you, are you making a slideshow right now? So uh, lastly, did I embarrass you? Be, be in touch with the softer side of yourself. You're fine. All right, sweet. All right. So last thing, and you guys can get out of here and go drink. So then how do you measure results? And so and it's... Um, Todd, did y'all the ones that mentioned, no, you weren't. The Google Stats uh, um, presentation, but we're in, um, the woman that was talking, and she was from your agency, I don't remember her name, but kind of mentioned how we don't know what the ramifications of Google Plus are yet with SEO. Um, certainly, I don't know what plussing a website or a link does, if it does anything at all, but I have done tests of just like for the last five years, I've been riding on the coattails of stuffing metadata inside of pictures and putting it at Flickr and ranking it well in Google for that. I started to do some tests with just taking images with targeted keywords in them, uploading them into Google Plus only and seeing where the results are on those. So whenever you're doing these, these images, one of the things you're looking for are people finding you based upon that content. Um, this is the Google Plus account that I use for all my imagery. And this was about two weeks into Google Plus and there were already 3,000 people following me. There's no way in hell that those people are people that I actually know. They found me through doing searches on stuff and finding my content, liking what they saw. Because I went through that list and I know, like, I know these two people in 
there's like eight people I know that were following me there. And it's not because I'm like young and sexy and hot. So there's that. Um, other, other way, look in the engagement on the imagery. This is again on Google+. These are all people that I go up there and I upload this content and then people come in. I never have people, when I don't optimize content, engage with, with photos like that and leave those kind of comments and favorite them that much. And part of this is, is because it's Callie Lewis and she's got her own fan base with Geek Beef. Um, but here, 88 pluses on this, on this, uh, this different uh, uh, portfolio. What does it look like in the search engines? Now this is my shtick whenever I talk. I go and I tell people what I do, then I go, here's the results. And I do a search and I pop up like number one, two, or three for social media expert. It feels so slimy. Um, what about photography? So I didn't start promoting myself as a photography until about two months ago. When I took these screenshots, I was about a month into it. Look at this. For Dallas Concert Photographer, I didn't rank anywhere. I didn't never optimize for it. Nobody knew I was a photographer at that point on the web. About a month into this, for Dallas Concert Photographer, one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are all me. And those are all places where I post my images. Six out of the top ten on the first page out of 108 million results. And that's only Google+, and it's only metadata inside of pictures. For Dallas Fashion Photographer, number 10, and God knows I'm all about fashion. Page 2 for Dallas Event Photography, uh, number 11 there for that. So it works. Um, and again from Kurt from earlier today, uh, his la one of his last quotes in his slide was, find your passion, use your talent. For me, it's my passion's photography, my talent's kind of SEO. I think SEO is kind of boring. Um, but I certainly love photography in any way that I can take that one thing that I love and use my skills and help feed my babies, it's a good thing. Um, make sure though that you're honing your talent in order to feed your passion, which means you're going out there and you're taking risks. You're doing things that are uncomfortable. You're sticking cameras where they shouldn't be. You're putting yourself in places where they shouldn't be because that's how you get those pictures that, I mean, there's so much content out there. You've got to do stuff that's going to stand out. And there's the spam. Um, I can give you this, plus I have, and, and there's a few people that see me speak, but I do have a thing called a social media manifest, which is basically the, the way that I run campaigns in social media. So if you go to galucci.net slash smm, I'll ask you, did I suck or was I awesome? I recommend you selecting awesome. Um, it's anonymous, but then you go to the next page after you answer that questionnaire, and then you can give me your email address, and you'll be emailed the social media manifest. I don't care what you do with the manifest. Just don't repost it to the web. Um, but you can take it and tell people you wrote it yourself. I could care less. Um, and with that, if you need to go drink beer now, leave. And if you have questions, I'll take questions from you. And someone stole my camera, so don't take my camera. Thank you.